let's just uh, quickly recap what we talked about uh, last week. Um, so remember last Thursday we were talking about threads, which are you know a single stream of execution within a process. Um, and so you know that generalizes the idea of a process we talked about in previous classes where we were really talking about just single thread <coughs> processes. And remember, you can have multiple threads within a single process, and they're all sharing the same address space, which makes it you know, very easy to share data. And then remember, we talked about two different types of thread implementations. Um, we talked about user-level threads, where you have some user-level library, um, nothing going on in the kernel. Um, so a benefit of that is no context switches. Um, a downside is that you're not going to get you know, true parallelism. Um, and then we have kernel level threads where threads are actually managed you know, by the kernel itself. You get nice things like parallelism, um, but you also have to deal with you know, the, the, the overhead of doing context switches and the like. And then we, you know, all of the same <coughs> scheduling strategies we already covered essentially equally apply when you're talking about scheduling threads rather than you know, scheduling processes. So today we're going to start talking about synchronization. So first we're going to you know, introduce a couple of the terms that you probably most of you are somewhat familiar with, um, mutual exclusion and critical sections. Um, and we're going to be talking through synchronization going back to a too much milk example, which I think um, may be used in 2.30 as well. Um, and so then today we're going to cover um, locks, which are you know, a specific type of synchronization primitive um, that lets us actually have critical sections um, you know, with mutual exclusion. So uh, just to recap, um, so let's give, give you the too much milk example. So you know, the scenario is that um, you know, there's you and your roommate, and you want to have you know, milk in your you know, apartment. And so you, know, you arrive home at you know, 3 o'clock, and you look in the fridge, and you see that there's no milk. So in order to get <coughs> milk, you leave for the grocery store. And while you're gone, your roommate comes home, looks in the fridge, sees that there's no milk, Meanwhile, you, you're at the grocery store. You've bought milk. Your roommate, meanwhile, has seen that there's no milk, so leaves for the grocery store. You get home, put the milk in the fridge, and then sometime later, your roommate gets home and has milk as well, and there you have you know, the problem, too much milk. So what? So talking about, you know, this is obviously a, a, a simple little story, but if we're talking about uh, you know, uh, threads and synchronization, you know, what are you and your roommate essentially standing in for here? Processes or threads, but yeah, threads or processes, right? So the idea is that this would be an example where we need synchronization to actually enable you know threads or processes to cooperate with each other. You know, in this case, what we want is we want you know two running threads to ensure that you're only getting milk once. You're not going to get milk twice, and you're not going to you know get milk not at all. You want to just make sure you get it once. So you know, to recap some of the terminology that we see in synchronization, and I'm sure you've seen many of these terms. Um, so you know, essentially, synchronization is just where we are you know, ensuring cooperation between processes. Um, and in particular, we're going to do that using you know, atomic operations, and we'll get more into the details of how we're doing that. Uh, remember, mutual exclusion is where you are ensuring that you have some particular activity. You know, in the previous example, you know, buying milk that you only want you know, one thread to be doing that at a time, and all other threads are you know, excluded from doing that. Um, a critical section is a specific piece of code that only one thread is allowed to execute at once. And then one of the mechanisms, and there are a couple of mechanisms we can use um, for you know, actually uh, getting these critical sections that have mutual exclusion, and a lock is one of those. It's you know, a simple mechanism that prevents one process you know, from doing something if uh, another process is already doing it. So, right, the idea behind a lock is if there's something you want to be doing that you only want one thread to be doing at a time, you're going to use a lock. And so one process or one thread is going to come and, you know, take ownership of the lock and then, you know, enter a critical section, do whatever, you know, the operation is. In the previous example, you know, you might capture a lock and then go to the store and buy milk. And then once you're done, you unlock, and then you know, other, other threads can then access the lock. And if you try to take a lock and it's already claimed by some other thread, you're just going to essentially be forced to wait until you know, the lock is available again. So you know, synchronization is all about essentially enforcing that threads wait when they need to to ensure that multiple threads can cooperate and don't end up you know, stepping on each other. <coughs> so 
our goal in talking about synchronization, you know, again, I'm sure that most of you have seen and probably used synchronization to some extent. But our goal here is not just to see, you know, not just to look at, you know, how you use synchronization as a programmer, but really to understand, you know, how the OS is actually providing those synchronization primitives to you and looking at, you know, how we can implement those. Um, and, you know, we'll be, you know, re returning several times to the, you know, too much milk example to sort of, you know, illustrate how this is working. So let's look at first some, you know, example solution to the too much milk problem. So when we're considering, you know, these type of synchronization problems, um, we really want to ensure two properties. Uh, the first property, which we can essentially call the safety property, is, is essentially that, you know, nothing bad happens. So in the context of this example, you know, what, what is the bad thing that happened? What? Right, exactly. You know, too much milk is the bad thing that you don't want to happen. Um, but you also want, you know, the liveness property, which essentially means that you are going to make some progress. So what that means is that, you know, what would, what would, if, I mean, if you, if no one buys milk, then that would be an example of, you know, clearly nothing bad happened, but you essentially made no progress on the problem. So you, you want to have both, you know, safety and liveness. So uh, let's look at, let's look at this example here. So we're going to try to solve this problem by having our threads leave a note. So, you know, we have, we have two threads and they're both, you know, executing the same code. And so a thread is first going to check, you know, is there no milk in the fridge? And is there no note? Now, if there's no note and no milk, then the thread is going to, you know, leave a note. And the purpose of the note is essentially to tell the other thread, you know, not to go buy milk. So you're going to leave the note, you're going to go buy milk, and then once you're back, you're going to remove the note. So, is this going to work? Is this going to solve the problem? Yeah? Uh, not necessarily, because if they, um, if one checks if no milk and no note, and then the other is switched in and checks if no milk and no note, they will both get the same. Right. Remember, the key point here is that we need to consider how these instructions might end up getting scheduled, right? These are running on separate threads, so they're getting scheduled separately. And essentially, at any point, we could switch from one thread to the other, you know, depending on how the CPU scheduler is working. So, for example, if, you know, thread A enters here and checks that there's no milk and no note, and both of those are true, so then it enters the if statement. And right after it enters the if statement, say its time slice expires. So thread A gets taken off the CPU. Thread B gets scheduled. Now thread B is going to run, is going to check that there's no milk and no note, and both of those are going to be true. So now what you have is thread B, say, is going to leave a note, buy milk, and remove the note. But then once you later switch back to thread A, you're already in the if statement, so you're going to do the same thing. And you, you run into the same problem as before, where you know, both threads ended up buying milk when you, you know, only wanted one to. So you know, right, the key point here is that in order to satisfy safety and liveness, you essentially have to ensure that you know, nothing bad will happen and you'll always make progress, regardless of how the CPU actually schedules you. So if you ran this code, you know, we already said you know, this, this doesn't work. But what does that really mean? So if I run this, is it guaranteed that it's going to, you know, buy milk twice? Yeah. It's a, be a very rare event to buy milk. Right. It's entirely possible that thread A will run and finish, and then thread B will run and everything will be fine, you know, no problems. So essentially when we say, does this work, we mean, is this always going to work regardless of how the CPU actually schedules the instructions? So we can essentially, we can pick any possible schedule. And if we can pick some schedule where either safety or liveness does not hold, then we're essentially saying, you know, this is not an actual solution. You know, it doesn't solve the synchronization problem. Does that make sense to people? So it's not about whether it always fails. It's about, or rather, it's, it's about whether you can show that it, it's always going to work, regardless of what the CPU scheduler is doing. So, you know, what I did five minutes ago is I just gave a very simple example of a schedule, you know, come in here, then context switch to thread B. That's a simple schedule that's possible that would result in uh, violating the safety property. So that's why, you know, this, this solution, you know, does not work. 
Any questions on the, the first example? Make sense to everyone? Okay. So let's consider, you know, a second example. So let's say that rather than using one note, we're going to use two notes. So what we're going to do here is uh, in thread A, we're first going to leave a note. Then we're going to check if there is a note from thread B already there. And then if there is no note and no milk, then we're going to go buy milk. And once we're done, we're going to remove our note. Uh, and similarly, thread B is doing essentially the same thing in reverse. Thread B is going to leave a note and then check from a note for a note from thread A. And if there isn't one and there's no milk, then we're going to buy milk. So what do people think? Is this going to work? Yeah. Right. So the problem here is that, you know, you could have thread A <coughs> leave a note and then switch to thread B and thread B leaves a note. So what's going to happen then? Yeah. Right, exactly. They both leave notes and then neither of them even checks if there is no milk, so obviously neither of them is going to buy milk. So what is what what property is this violating? Right, liveness. So right, this, this is safe. There's no way in which both threads are going to be able to buy milk at the same time. But you are going to have the possibility of nobody making any progress at all. So this does not have a problem with safety, but it does have a problem with liveness. Do people see how that's working? So this, this is essentially you know, the, the opposite problem of the first solution. So let's look at a, a third example. So here we're going to make it a little bit more complicated, and we're going to have threads A and B running separate programs. So now uh, we're going to have thread B the same as before. It's going to leave a note. It's going to check if there's a note from A. And then if there's no note, it'll check for milk. And if there's no milk, it'll buy milk. Once it's done, it'll remove the note. Now thread A instead is going to leave the note. But now what we're going to do is we're going to loop on note B. So while there is a note from note B, we're going to do nothing. And we're only going to continue past here once the note from note B has been removed. And once the note from note B has been removed, we'll actually check if there's milk. And if there isn't, then we'll buy milk. And then finally, we'll remove note A. So what do people think? Is this going to work? Right, so, so this is a good example. You know, this, this example is not, it's not obvious whether it's actually going to work or not. So, I mean, we don't, we, we don't have the, the exact problems we had previously, or at least it's not, it's not obvious how we could come up with a schedule that, you know, satisfy, you know, a schedule that violates either safety or aliveness. Um, but it's really not clear from looking at this, you know, if it's going to work or not. So we can consider sort of another, you know, extension of, you know, the story that sort of explains what's going on here. So one way to understand this is that um, you have essentially one person, you know, thread A, is, is essentially more paranoid about running, about uh, having, getting, ending up with too much milk. So thread A is going to come, and it, if it sees that there's a note from thread B, then it's just going to essentially wait by the fridge until either milk arrives or it doesn't. And if milk arrives at some point, then it will obviously not buy more milk. And if no milk arrives and the note gets removed, then it's going to go ahead and buy milk. So what do people think? Is this going to work? Yeah. Wouldn't thread A not buy milk in this situation? How do you mean? Wouldn't thread A not buy milk? Because it looks like they're just constantly waiting for a note B. And note B just like, like because note A is already left, then it, like, thread B can't, like, A is already, A is left all the time, so thread B can't buy it. Well, so, so remember, right here, this while loop, this is saying that while there is a note from B, we're going to do nothing. So when <coughs> thread B executes, the first thing it does is leave a note, and then the last thing it does is remove a note. And maybe it buys milk, maybe it doesn't. But in either case, thread B is going to run and is going to remove a note. 
So if we're in this while loop, we're waiting for the note to be removed. And we know that the note is going to be removed because thread B is never, you know, thread B is never going to you know, loop and you know, loop continuously. Thread B is always going to eventually remove the note. So we know that thread A is not going to just block indefinitely. Yep. So idle uh, thread A is just idling the whole time. Right. Thread A is just sitting there idling. Yes, that's that's a problem we'll get to in a second. But yes. So thread A is just you know idling there doing nothing until thread B is done. Yeah. Also if we add a roommate, don't we have to like alter and modify? Yes, that's another problem which we'll, we'll we'll get to in a second. Yeah, you're you're ahead of me. So it's not concurrent. Yeah, so, so essentially what we're trying to do here, right, is we're trying to essentially emulate a lock. So what we're trying to do is basically take a lock that says, you know, I'm going to execute this, this <coughs> sequence to check if there's milk or not, and if there isn't, I'm going to buy some. And while I'm doing that, the other thread is not allowed to do that. So essentially what we're trying to get to is a lock here. Um, so it's true that you know this is is sort of not concurrent because they're blocking each other. But you know, in practice, you might have code you know before leaving the node and after removing the node. You're going to have you know other things going on in the threads, and that can run concurrently. Um, so that's true that you know within this specific piece of code, the threads are basically not running at the same time. Um, but that's not so much a problem as far as you know solving the synchronization problem is concerned. So basically. I'm going to argue that this is actually correct. This does have safety and it does have liveness. Um, but you know, we can see that clearly it's, it's not trivial to see that. Yeah, do you have a question? So I guess the analogy for this, going back to the kitchen one, since they're standing by the fridge, thread A could go and clean the house and come back and see if there's something like this coming. Right, I mean, thread A is, is essentially sitting in a loop repeatedly checking if thread B has finished checking if there's milk and buying some if, ne if needed. So, you know, once it exits this while loop, thread B is no longer essentially doing anything. Thread B is done. And so then we know that, you know, thread A has now, you know, free reign to go check if there's milk and buy some. And in the meantime, thread A previously left a note. So we know that thread B is not going to come back and, you know, buy milk again after thread A, you know, starts checking and buying milk if needed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So essentially what we're doing is we're in this in a while and could actually do something that would ultimately go need from it. You could potentially. Right. right. I mean we're we're, we're essentially we're sitting here saying it's not safe to buy. buy milk, you know, or rather even to check if we need to buy milk and then do it if needed. Essentially we're saying here, thread B is doing something related to this. We're gonna wait until thread B is done and then we're gonna check. So one way we can actually, you know, sort of give a, sort of almost prove that this is correct is to consider, uh, let's consider the two points in this program, X and Y. So, you know, X is a, a point in this program where thread A could be, and Y is a point in thread B in the, Y is a point where thread B could be. So let's first consider point Y. So if thread B is at that line, point Y, there's basically two scenarios. In scenario one, there is a note from A, in scenario two, there is not a note from A. So let's consider what happens in both of those scenarios. So suppose there is a note from A, then what's going to happen? What does that mean? So thread B is right here at this line, and there is a note A. So what does that mean? What's going to happen? Right, so thread B is not going to do anything. Thread B is just going to exit. And what do we know about thread A? Because remember, we said there is a note. This is the first scenario. There is a note from A. So what does that mean? What's now, what's now going to happen in thread A? Yeah. Right. So thread B will exit without doing anything. And thread A is now going to check if it needs to buy milk, and it will if it needs to. So that's going to end up correctly, right? You either will or will not buy milk. But in either case, you're, you're never going to buy too much milk, but you will buy it if you need to. Right? So that's one scenario. That's the scenario if there was a note from A at this point. And if there was no note from A at that point, then what does that mean? So what's going to happen if there is no note from, from A? Yeah. Right, so if there is no note from A, 
then thread B is going to check if it needs to buy milk and will do so if it needs to. And what do we know about the operation of thread A if there was no note? So if there was no note, we know essentially thread A is not anywhere in here. Thread A is essentially not executing this piece of code. So we know that even if thread A shows up, it's going to encounter a note from thread B and it's not going to proceed. So I won't belabor the details, but you can essentially make a, the same argument for, uh, for this point of X, where you know, if you're here in, the, in thread A, you can consider two cases, whether there is a note from thread B or whether there is not a note from thread B. And in either case, you can show, if you just work through the details, that in both cases, you're always going to buy milk if you need to, but at no point is it possible for both threads to buy milk. So, so this is correct. This is a correct solution. So you know, this solves the synchronization problem. So, so who is excited to go out and start programming like this? Yeah, right, so, so this is terrible. No one actually wants to program like this. You know, this is, it's correct, but it's, you know, it's very hard to see that it's correct, and you can work through the details, but, like, no one actually wants to, you know, have to write this kind of code and then, you know, look through it, look at it for 20 minutes to figure out whether it's actually, you know, going to be, going to solve the synchronization problem at hand. So again, I won't go through, but these are, you know, I already went through some of these. This is basically just, you know, the complete details of showing that, yes, this is in fact correct. So, so what are, there, there are basically three problems with this approach. Um, and you mentioned one of them already. So what's a, what's a problem with this approach? Even though it is correct, it solves the problem, but what's not ideal? If you add a yeah. new roommate, then you're going to also have more code. Yes, that's a, that's a good problem. Is essentially this code is asymmetric. And what we mean by that is, you know, threads A and B have to run different code for this to work. And if we add another roommate, then you will have to change even more code. Essentially, you know, the fact that they're essentially trying to do the same thing, right? The goals of thread A and thread B are the same. You want to get just enough milk, not too much, not too little. But even though the goals are the same, they're having to run different code in order to accomplish that. So that's not ideal. Um, we also, you know, and I also talked about how, you know, obviously this is, this is complex, and the complexity of this is a problem. Um, and there's one other sort of problem with this as it's written here that you also mentioned, actually. Yeah? Uh, theoretically, they could uh, waste some human resources with thread A sitting in the wild. Yes, so great. That's the, that's the third problem. The third problem is, while we're doing this, you know, what is this thread actually doing? So is that thread continuing to use CPU cycles? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? When we're doing this, this thread is still running. It's just repeatedly executing, you know, the same, the same check over and over and over again. So it will take as much CPU as you give it, and it will basically just burn CPU cycles. So that's called busy waiting, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that later. But you know, that's that's essentially a problem with this: is that while thread A is waiting, it's just wasting CPU cycles. So ideally, of course, we would rather that you know thread A do something like go to sleep until it's ready to continue. But in this case, you know, it's not doing that. It's just busy waiting. So, you know, is solution three a good solution? You know, there's these three problems we talked about. A, it's, it's complicated, and although it is correct, it's really hard to convince yourself that it's correct. Um, it has this problem of asymmetric. Threads A and B are running different code. And if you wanted to add more threads, you'd have to add even more different code. And the third problem is that thread A is busy waiting. You know, it's not doing any useful work, just repeatedly checking the same condition over and over again. Um, so, so that's the that's third problem. So we really can't easily write programs, you know, using, you know, using these kinds of approaches for synchronization. So what we really need are, you know, better, what we really need is better language support for synchronizations. So we need better, you know, programming constructs. Um, and we'll see, you know, the addition of some hardware constructs make our life much easier. But we need essentially better language support to solve these kinds of synchronization problems. Right, because this is sort of the, the, the too much milk example is almost the simplest possible synchronization question. And it still, you know, required this, you know, sort of complicated program to solve as we've done it already. So... In order to deal with this, you know, programming languages all provide you know, a variety of atomic routines to do synchronization. And let's quickly review what do we mean by an atomic routine? What, what do we mean by atomic? Yeah. Lowest level. 
while it's true that it's going to be usually implemented at the hardware, like hardware provides support for atomic operations, yep. Right, so it might be true, it might take several CPU cycles, but it's treated as if it's one. Um, Logically, that's true. Now, typically, oftentimes, it will actually be one CPU cycle, um, but, but that gets at the right idea. The right idea is that an atomic operation cannot be interrupted. You know, once you start an atomic operation, you're going to complete the atomic operation, and you're guaranteed that somewhere in the middle of that, you know, you're, you're, the CPU didn't change to some other process and start executing some other code. You know, an atomic, a, atomic code is, is basically all or nothing. Either you haven't executed any of it, or once you've started executing it, you're guaranteed to execute all of it. So that's what we mean by an atomic routine. So there's a number of different types of language support for synchronization. Um, so I already mentioned the idea of a lock, which is that you know, if you have a lock, one process can hold the lock. And while it holds the lock, it can do some section of critical code. And then it's going to release the lock. And while the lock is held, no other process can come and claim the lock. Um, and then there are semaphores, which are more general versions of lock, and monitors, which add this idea of condition variables. Um, have you guys seen all of these in 2.30? Not monitors, but locks and semaphores? Okay. So today we're just going to be covering locks, um, but on Thursday we'll cover semaphores and monitors as well. Um, but we're going to see that uh, you know, all three of these types require some kind of hardware support. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, synchronization at its core is all about inserting weights when you need to. So we are still going to have to do you know, some form of weighting in here. So let's talk about locks. So the idea of a lock is pretty simple. You're going to provide mutual exclusion using two atomic routines. So remember, atomic routines means once we start executing these, we're guaranteed not to get interrupted in the middle. So the two routines are going to be acquiring a lock and releasing a lock. So when you acquire a lock, you know, a lock is either taken by some other process or free, not taken by anyone. So if you try to acquire a lock and it's free, you're going to take ownership of that lock immediately and you're free to proceed you know, into the critical section of code. And if you try to acquire a lock and it's not free, which meant that someone previously called acquire on it, then you're essentially your, your thread is going to block, basically. You're going to stop executing until the lock is free again. And the way a lock becomes free is that the thread that previously called acquire, subsequently, after doing whatever it needs to in the critical section, is going to call release. So when you release, the lock is now free again. And then if there are other threads waiting to acquire the lock, you can wake up the next thread that's waiting, and now it's going to take possession of the lock and it's, you know, we'll, we'll start executing again. So, right, so the basic rules for using a lock are, you know, when we're accessing shared data, we always acquire the lock before accessing shared data. So while we have the, you know, as long as everyone tries to get the lock before accessing shared data, you're guaranteed that at no point are two processes going to be accessing the data at the same time. Because you only access it if you have acquired the lock, and you're guaranteed that only one process has the lock at any time. And then, of course, once you're finished with shared data, you have to you know, release the lock in order to ensure that other people in the future, other threads, will be able to acquire it. And we, of course, need the lock initially to be free. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to acquire it in the first place. So you know, the, basically, the, the acquire and release of the lock are guaranteed by the hardware. Um, so, you know, even if you have something like, you know, a multiprocessor system with threads executing concurrently, even in that case, you know, the hardware is going to guarantee that when you call acquire, even if you have two threads executing at once and they both call acquire, you know, one of them is going to take the lock and the other one is going to block. So, you know, that, that the, the, you know, acquire and release um, definitions are, are guaranteed by the hardware. So let's look at how we can actually implement, you know, too much milk using locks. So again, we have, you know, thread A and B. And here it's actually pretty straightforward. So they both have access to this lock. And so they're both, again, running the same code. So this is, you know, this is symmetric code again. And we're going to call lock.acquire. And after that, you know, we're going to check if there's no milk. We're going to buy milk if there isn't. And then we're going to release the lock. So you know, if, if uh, thread A comes in and calls acquire, 
So if the lock is free, it's going to take possession of the lock and continue executing. If, if the lock is not free, then what does that mean? If thread A tried to call it and you know, the, the, the lock is not free, then what does that mean? Right, B is using the lock, which means that B is somewhere in here, having previously called the choir. B is going to check if there's milk, cry it if needed, and then release the lock. Once B calls release on the lock, it's going to be given to thread A. And remember, in the meantime, thread A was just blocked on this call. It's just sitting there doing nothing. Um, once thread B releases the lock, thread A is going to acquire it, and then it's going to have possession of the lock. It will do the same check. And so you know, what we're doing here is we're guaranteeing that one thread at a time is checking if there's milk. And if there isn't milk, you're going to go buy it. But you're never going to have a situation where one thread gets to here, and then you switch to another thread, and the other thread is also in here. Because by definition, only one thread has the lock at any given time. Yeah? Since um, uh, lock release wake, uh, wakes the uh, threads up, I assume is not visiting? Right, yes. In general, uh, we'll, we'll look at specific implementations of lock. But in general, you're not, in most cases, going to have to actually do busy waiting. So this is you know, preferable to the previous example, where we are you know, spinning, wasting CPU cycles while waiting. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have multiple threads waiting on uh, all trying to acquire a lock at the same time, in general you're going to have a wait queue in the same way that when we talked about CPU scheduling, when you have multiple threads that want to execute on the CPU, you have a wait queue of processes waiting to be scheduled. So it's the same idea here. We have some shared resource. Rather than the CPU, it's this specific lock. And obviously the meaning of that lock is defined by the programmer. You know, in this case, it's you know, the, the lock to prevent getting too much milk. And so you're going to have a queue of threads that are all waiting to acquire the lock. Yeah? Well, the OS could schedule some other process to run. So thread A could acquire this lock and be here, and then its time slice ends and it gets switched off. So, but the thing is, we're not going to switch to thread B because thread B is waiting for the lock to be, to be free. So thread B is not even, so if, if you're using busy waiting, which again, we wouldn't, but if you were using busy waiting, then while you're scheduling thread B, you're just going to be sitting here busy waiting, not actually making any progress. But in practice, since we're not going to have to use busy waiting, thread B is not going to be scheduled because it's, it's essentially in a waiting state. It's not, you know, it's, it's not able to proceed. So, you know, we can, you know, thread A can get interrupted, but you're never going to end up in a situation where both thread a, threads A and B are inside the, the critical section, which is, you know, the, the code surrounded by locking. Does that make sense? Any other questions on how this is working? Right, so, so this is, you know, there's, there's no possible schedule here that can cause bad things to happen. You know, we, we make no assumptions on when the CPU might, you know, context switch out of thread A or thread B, but we know that any way that it happens, you know, we still have safety and we still have liveness in, the, in this example. So this is really, you know, nice and simple and clean for the programmer. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot to this. Um, but we're interested in answering the question, you know, how are we actually doing this acquire and release? Because remember, the key point here is that acquire and release are autonomous. You know, once you execute it, you execute it all at once, and you can't have a case where, you know, two threads are trying to acquire at the same time, and as a result, they both get the lock. You know, that's what we are avoiding by having the lock methods be atomic. So next, we're going to talk about, you know, how we actually are making the locks be atomic. So essentially, we need to have some kind of support from the hardware to do this. Um, so we have both essentially low-level you know, hardware support that allows us to you know, build these synchronization primitives. And then using those low, using those low level uh, that low level hardware support, we can actually implement things like locks, semaphores, and monitors, which are the things that you as a programmer are actually using. But those are essentially higher level you know, software constructs, even though they still act as if they're atomic. You know, those are higher level constructs that are built using you know, lower level atomic operations. 
So, you know, what we're, what we're next going to talk about is, um, and I should mention, you know, we, we previously, uh, in some of the earlier lectures, mentioned a few of these things. Um, so I'll see, you know, what interrupts are in testing set was something that, that we mentioned, I think, in the first class very briefly, as an example of hardware support. So um, we're going to next talk about how we can actually take a lock and implement it using some of these low-level uh, atomic hardware operations. So first of all, let's consider uh, implementing uh, lock using disabling interrupts. So that's going to be the first approach. So a useful way to think about this is what sort of caused the synchronization problems in the first place? Like what, what was the, I mean, what, what is it that causes problems potentially in the too much milk example? What is the OS doing that's causing problems? Who said that? Yeah, right. So context switching is the problem. So the problem is that we could be executing the program, but a context switch could happen at any time. Um, or, you know, essentially more generally, it doesn't necessarily, it, it, it could be for a number of reasons, but, you know, whenever the CPU scheduler is getting control of the program, it could switch to some other process, and that's what causes our synchronization problems. So, you know, how is it that we're actually, how is it that the CPU scheduler is actually taking control of the program and then potentially doing a context switch? So, there's essentially two possible ways. Um, the first is if we have some internal event within the program. So if you're doing, you know, something like I.O., what's happening when you make an I.O. call? Yeah. You're right, you're waiting for the I.O. to return. I mean, you're issuing a system call, right? So you're essentially issuing a system call, and you are, you know, relinquishing your control of the CPU. You're jumping to some other bit of code. So that's one way in which, you know, the CPU schedule is essentially taking control back from the active thread. Um, and the second way is, you know, other types of you know, interrupts. So if you are, if the CPU scheduler has a time slice and the time slice expires, you know, the timer may fire an interrupt that causes the scheduler to take control away from from the current thread. So the idea is that, you know, how can we, in order to get a lock that is atomic, one way to do that is to essentially prevent the CPU from taking control away from the running process until you're done acquiring the lock. Right, because that's entirely, the, the whole problem is we don't want you to be trying to acquire the lock and have the CPU take control away and start running some other process or some other thread. So what we can do is we can essentially disable interrupts um, in the OS. So we need to essentially do two things. Um, first, we need to ensure that you're not actually going to execute any I.O. within a critical section. Because if your program is going to execute I.O., then you're guaranteed that there's going to be an interrupt there. So you essentially have to enforce you know, no I.O. operations during a critical section. That will handle you know, internal events. There won't be any of those. And in order to handle external events, you're going to actually have the kernel you know, disable interrupts. And so what that means is that, you know, remember, interrupts are constantly arriving and may have nothing to do with your program. There may be you know, other I.O. devices or other external events happening. So we're just going to tell the hardware, you know, while I'm executing, executing this critical section, you know, delay any external events. So depending on the architecture, you may take interrupts that arrive during that period and you may just throw them away, or you may essentially queue them, and then after you re-enable interrupts, you know, process the outstanding queue of interrupts that arrived while they were disabled. Does that make sense to people? So we're essentially covering all of the possible ways that we could, you know, that the current program could lose control of the CPU and get switched to something else. So, so the uh, so the way we essentially can do this is by having acquire and release uh, be system calls. So let's look at an example of doing that. So this shows an example of how we can actually implement a lock class. So what we're going to have here is we're going to have you know class lock, and it's going to have you know the two. Uh, the two operations we previously described, we have acquire and release, and then the internal state of the lock is going to be a value, which is essentially binary. It's going to be, um, you know, zero if the lock is not currently held, one if the lock is currently held by some process, and we're going to have a queue, which is um, just essentially what I mentioned previously, the wait queue. Those are processes that want to acquire the lock, but can't right now because 
you know, another process currently has the lock and there may be other processes that are waiting in line ahead of whatever the current process that wants the lock is. So when we create the lock, you know, initially the lock is free, so value is zero, and the queue is empty. You know, there's nothing that's waiting to acquire the lock. So what happens when we're going to try to acquire the lock? So we have some thread T that wants to acquire the lock. So first, we're going to disable interrupts. So when we disable interrupts, remember, this is enforcing that you know, we're not going to lose control of the CPU and get context switched to something else. So that's what we're enforcing as soon as we disable interrupts. Then we're going to check if value is busy, which means the lock is held. So if the lock is held, we're going to take the current thread, we're going to add it to the wait queue, and then we're going to take the thread and put it to sleep. Right, so this is again, you know, it's, we don't want to do busy waiting. We're just going to put the thread to sleep until it's ready to run again. And if the lock is not busy, if the lock is free, then we're going to now say, you know, the lock is busy because the current thread now holds it. And then we're essentially done. We can re-enable interrupts. And once we've re-enabled interrupts, you know, we can again be context switch to other processes, but we've already done all of the necessary logic to ensure that, you know, two threads cannot acquire the lock at the same time. That makes sense to people? Because, you know, as soon as we exit this, you know, if we've taken the lock, value is now busy. So the next person that comes through is now going to see that value is busy, that the lock is held, so it's not going to be able to take it as well. So then, you know, the release is, is very similar. First, we're going to disable interrupts. Then we're going to take a look at this wait queue. Remember, because release means the current thread that holds the lock is done with it. So if there is something waiting to take the lock, that would be in the, in the waiting queue. So we're going to take the first thread off the waiting queue, um, and then we're going to put it on the ready queue, which means, right, because that means that the thread is ready to run again. So now that the lock is free, we can schedule it again, and once the thread starts running, it's going to, again, come into you know, lock acquire and try to acquire the lock. Of course, if nothing else is waiting on the lock, then the lock value just becomes free again, and we re-enable interrupt. So, of course, you know, again, it's important to note that we're making the assumption here that in order to call release, you actually have to hold the lock. You know, if you call release and you don't hold the lock, then essentially all guarantees of how the lock, of how the lock works goes away. You know, if you can just sort of arbitrarily call release at any point. Um, so oftentimes that could, that could in theory be enforced by the OS, or you could basically just have it as, you know, a convention that, you're not supposed to call release unless you have actually previously acquired the lock. So, you know, I talked about this as, you know, a system call. Um, why, is, why does this have to be in a system call? Why can't we do this in a user library? Or can we do this in a user library? Right, because in general, we don't want to make something a system call unless there's a good reason to do so, because there's extra overhead involved in that. So why would we, might we need to make this a system call? Right, exactly. Remember, it's this thing here. When we disable interrupts, you know, that in some sense is a very powerful operation because what it means is we essentially have complete control of the CPU and nothing is going to be able to take it away from us. You know, if we wanted to, go, if we wanted to in there insert an infinite loop, we would just take down the system because context switches would never happen. We'd never switch to some other process um, and no interrupts can, you know, disrupt the current thread. So you know, disabling interrupts is a privileged operation that we definitely do not want a user program to be allowed to do. So you know, we could, in theory, do this in user mode, but we'd have to let the user disable interrupts, and that means that we open ourselves up to you know, having a user process that essentially takes over the entire system. So that's essentially why you know, this, this requires this to be implemented inside the kernel, which is, you know, for efficiency reasons, we'd rather not have to do that. But in order to disable interrupts, we do. Other questions on this? Okay. So uh, that's how we can do this, you know, using locks. Um, now let's look at a second way to do this. Um, or sorry, not using locks. Um, that's how we do locks using disabling interrupts. But now let's consider another way that we can do this that doesn't involve disabling interrupts. So that's, you know, that was a kernel implementation. Now we're going to look at a, a, a implementation that can run in user space, right? So for example, when you write a Java program, 
Um, you know, locks in a Java program are implemented by the JVM itself, so there's no kernel support going on here. So what we can do is we still are going to need some kind of hardware support, but we're going to use what are called read, modify, write instructions. So the idea here is that we're going to read a value from memory and write a new value, and that's going to happen at atomically. So remember the same idea here is that you, know, you could easily read a value into a register and then write a new value without using any kind of hardware support. But typically that's going to be you know, multiple assembly instructions to actually do that. And when you have multiple assembly instructions, you, know, you could get a context switch in the middle of that and that is what you know, causes the synchronization problems in, in too much milk. So read, modify, write instructions are going to essentially do multiple things and the hardware is able to do it as one instruction. Since it's doing it as one instruction, you're guaranteed that it's never going to be interrupted. So uh, depending on the architecture, there's a couple of different types of read, modify, write instructions. Um, the most common one that we're going to deal with the most is called test and set. So the idea with test and set is that you're going to read some value, you're going to write one back, so you're going to read some value that may be, say, 0 or 1, you're going to overwrite the value with one, and you're going to return the old value. So if you're saying test and set x you know, on some variable x, and the value of x is zero, then after that call returns, the value of x is now one, and it returned the return call is zero because that's what the value of x was when you when you called the when you called the instruction. Um, there are a couple of other different uh, examples um, that do things like swapping values between registers and memory, um, but in practice, uh, we essentially are only going to need to worry about um, test and set can, since we can essentially do you know, everything with that. So any questions on this? You know, the point is it's essentially multiple assembly instructions collapsed into one assembly instruction, and we need hardware support in order to do that. And by doing that, we have you know, hardware support for these atomic values. Um, that will that will let us actually uh, implement synchronization primitives. So let's look at how we can actually do that. So let's consider the question of how do we actually go about implementing locks using the test and set you know atomic instruction. So remember test and set we're reading a value, writing one back to memory and returning the old value. That's all test and set does. It's pretty straightforward. So we again have the same thing. We have a lock, we have a acquire and release, and we have you know, whether the lock is free or not. So when we acquire the lock, what we're going to do is we're going to say while test and set of the value of the lock is 1. So let's think about what that's doing. So when you're calling test and set, value, remember, which is whether the lock is, whether the lock is held or not, the lock is either held, meaning value is 1, or it's not held, it's free, meaning the value is 0. So what happens if the lock is free? So if the lock is free, then what's, the, what's value equal to? Right, so if, if the lock is free, then value is 0. And so, what is this in, so what is, what's going to be the case after this test and set returns, after you call test and set? So what's going to be the, the return value of that of that? Uh, instruction. Zero. Right. It's going to be zero because remember it's returning the previous value which was zero because the lock was free and uh, then what is what is the value of the lock after that test and set finishes executing? One. Right? Because that by definition is what test and set is doing. It's reading a value, returning it, and writing one over writing the old value. Always one. So that's what happens if, if the lock is, is uh, available. You're just going to run that test and set. It's going to return zero, so you're going to break out of that while loop and you're done. You know, you, the, the lock has been acquired. So what happens if the lock is acquired? What happens if the lock is already held? So what's going to happen with that test and set? What's it going to do? Yeah. Right, it's going to loop because the value of value to begin with is going to be one because the lock is already held, and you're going to what is and test and set is going to overwrite the value with one, which was the same thing it was to begin with. So value is not going to change, and it's going to return one. So that is just going to again do busy waiting, right? So as long as the lock is held, 
that's going to just loop infinitely and is never going to proceed. And then release is trivial. Once you call release, you know, again, you're assuming that value is currently one, the lock is held, and now you're setting value back to zero. So what impact is that going to have on, you know, if you have thread A acquired the lock and thread B is waiting on the lock, and now thread A calls release and value is now zero. So what's going to happen in thread B? Right. The next time it comes through test and set, previously test and set has just been returning one over and over and over again. This time it's going to return zero, and it's only going to do that once because after it returns zero once, it's setting the value of the lock back to one. But it returns zero that one time, so uh, the thread is going to break out of the while loop and is now acquired the lock. So, what? So what exactly is it that you know? I've mentioned several times, you know, test and set is atomic. So why is that making this work? What's the importance of test and set being atomic here? So if test and set were not an atomic instruction, what, what, let's just say test and set were some little function we wrote. What would test and set be doing? Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could get rescheduled for in between test Right, right. Essentially, you could, you know, be testing the value, and you could have, you know, multiple threads test the value and see a value of zero, for example. So you could have two threads, A and B, call test and set, see that the current value is zero, then set it to one. They could both be doing that because you could, you know, have thread A check the value, context switch to thread B, thread B checks the value, and now they're both going to write one back, and you run into the same problem as before where both have identified the lock as free and are going to continue. So because test and set is atomic, that situation can never happen. You're guaranteed that the test and set operation happens as one unit. So I already mentioned it, but you know, this, is, this is nice and simple and it's correct, but what is, what is the problem with this, this approach that we've already seen? Yeah. Right. The problem again is you know, in the previous example where we were disabling interrupts, we didn't have to do busy waiting. We had that nice, you know, wait queue. So that's, so that's good. Um, but the problem here is that you know, we're, doing, we're doing that busy waiting where we're just spinning the CPU, you know, doing no useful work. So there are a couple of other potential problems with this. Um, so we already said, you know, what is the CPU doing? It's essentially just running test and set over and over again, not doing any useful work. Um, what if we consider, you know, a bunch of different threads that are vying for the lock? So let's say we have, you know, five different threads that are all vying for the lock. So what are they all doing? Yeah. They're all busy waiting, right. So they're all executing this loop. So what is going to determine when someone, or, or rather I should say, who is going to get the lock? If you have, you know, five threads that are all executing this, test and set over and over again, at some point the thread that has the lock is going to call unlock. And then who is going to take possession of the lock? Yeah. Right. Basically, you have a bunch of threads that are all getting scheduled at various times. And once the lock is released, the very next thread that calls test and set is going to get that return value of zero, and only that thread. That thread is going to be the one that takes the lock. But are we imposing any kind of ordering on what thread that might be? Like, do we know anything about how the school, like, what the next thread to be scheduled is? No, not really, right? The scheduler could be scheduling things in any kind of way. And so what happens if we have, say, a thread with very high priority and a thread with very low priority, both vying for the lock? What's going to happen most of the time? Who's going to get the lock most of the time if one thread has high priority and the other thread has low priority according to the CPU scheduler? Right, the high priority thread is, being, is going to be scheduled with higher priority than the low priority thread. And the only thing that determines who takes the lock is the next thread to execute. 
So the low priority thread could be waiting for an hour. And if a high priority thread arrives, it might only wait for a second because you know the, the high priority thread is almost certainly going to be the next one that takes possession of the lock. So this again, we're losing something that we that was useful in the case where we were disabling interrupts, where we A did not have that busy waiting, and B, we had a nice wait queue. So we were essentially ensuring that there was some nice orderly fashion in which threads were going to be given the lock, and there was never going to be a case where you know, a thread might be waiting on the lock forever while it keeps being given out to other processes in the meantime. People understand how that's working? So that's, that's, that's basically two different problems with this approach. We have busy waiting and it's potentially unfair just based on however threads are being scheduled. So let's uh, take a look at how to enhance this so we don't have to do quite so much busy waiting. So Again, remember the goal here is we want to use locks and we want to do test and set so that we don't have to rely on kernel support. Um, but we don't want to do any busy waiting and we don't want to have to disable interrupts or anything like that. So the way we're going to do this is rather than using test and set on the value of the lock itself, we're going to introduce a new variable which we're going to call a guard variable. So this is going to be another zero or one variable. And it's essentially going to guard access to the acquire and release methods. So what's going to happen is when we call acquire, we're going to say while test and set guard is one. So remember, we still have value, which is whether the lock is, is uh, taken or not. But now we have this additional value guard. So we're going to busy wait on the guard variable. And so uh, you know, once if, if guard is zero, then the thread is going to continue going, and guard is now one, because that's what test and set does. And we're going to do the same thing as before in the interrupt case. We're going to check if the lock is currently occupied. If the lock is currently taken, we're going to take the thread, put it on the waiting queue, and then we're going to call sleep on the thread so that we don't have to busy wait. And then once we've done that, we're going to set guard back to zero. Uh, if the lock is free, the lock is now going to be busy because the current thread acquired the lock. And then finally, we're going to set guard to zero. And so then the release case is very similar. We're going to have that while test and set guard is one. And then we're going to look at the waiting queue. If there is someone waiting, we're going to take the next person off the waiting queue, put them on the ready queue so that they start executing again. Um, and if there's no one on the queue, then the lock is just free again. And then we set guard back to zero. So this is essentially the same idea as disabling interrupts, but Rather than disabling interrupts, we're doing this, we're using this guard variable in a, in a while test and set on the guard variable. So, is, so, uh, is this, has this eliminated busy waiting? Are we doing any busy waiting in this example? So what was it that what was it that was causing the busy waiting in the previous example? Yeah. Right. So what was that? What was like programming the little construct that was that causing the busy wait? Right. Exactly. It was a while test and set value of the lock is one. So this looks pretty similar, right? It's the same thing except we're saying, well, test and set guard is one rather than the value of the lock. So this is, again, ensuring that you know, only one thread at once is going to get into this section, right? Because guard is, you know, guard is essentially guarding this critical section. If two threads come trying to acquire at once, one of them is going to hit the guard variable equal to zero, and only one of them, and it will continue. The other one is going to be stuck at this while loop until guard is set back to zero by the previous thread. Is this actually missing because there is no, there's no body to Oh, well, it's a, there's a semicolon here. So this is just a uh, shorthand for, for do nothing. Uh, this is, yeah, the syntax is just saying uh, execute the next statement. You know, since there's no parentheses, the next statement is blank. So that is, that's just doing a, a loop with no body. Yeah. So is this busy waiting? 
Yeah, this is still doing busy waiting. So why is this better than what we were doing previously? So we're still doing busy waiting, but we're doing it on this guard variable rather than the value of the lock. So why is that better? Right, so you're saying you're just putting, you're putting threads on a queue rather than doing what? Right, so remember the difference here from previously is that previously we were not putting threads to sleep. We were just busy waiting on the lock variable. We were essentially busy waiting until the lock is available again. And how long might that duration be? How long might the lock be occupied? Do we know anything about how long the lock might be occupied? Yeah. Uh, right, exactly. The lock is guarding some critical section of whoever is using the lock. And we don't know anything about how long that critical section is. That critical section could be extremely long. And if that critical section is extremely long, then that entire time, other threads that are trying to acquire the lock are just going to be sitting and busy waiting on the lock. That was in the previous example. So what is going to happen in this example? Yeah. Are we going to busy wait until the next, um, so, it's, so the latest thread that uh, set guard to, set guard to one uh, gets set time to sleep. Right, exactly. So what's happening here is, what do we know about how long you're going to have to busy wait on the guard variable? What do we know about that? Do we have any guarantees on how long that's going to be busy waiting for? Yeah. Right, exactly. We are using the guard variable in here, and the guard variable is being set back to zero immediately after completing this thread. I mean, completing this method, either the acquire or the release method. At the end of both of them, you're setting guard back to zero. So you're executing a very small piece. So we've essentially taken what was previously busy waiting on a potentially arbitrarily long critical section, and we've replaced it with busy waiting on a critical section that is very, very small. So you are going to be doing busy waiting, but only for the time it takes for other threads to get through either the acquire or the release method. And because these methods are you know, very, very simple, there's only a few instructions and they're not doing anything like I.O. that might take a long time, we're essentially guaranteed that the amount of time you spend busy waiting in this is going to be minimal. Right? So you're ensuring that one thread at a time is executing either acquire or release. But that is not related to who is actually holding the lock or whether the lock is held. So it, the time it takes to actually execute, acquire, and release is very fast. And so the amount of busy waiting you do is very, very small. Yeah? Yeah, so sleep would be typically a system call, right? Because essentially what you're doing when you call sleep is you're saying, you're telling the, the OS to take the current, you know, take thread T out of the um, running queue and stick it in the waiting queue. Right, because that's, that's what we're doing. When we call t.sleep, we're saying the thread that is currently running, don't run it anymore, put it to sleep. And what's going to happen later is when we take that thread off the, the queue, then we're going to change it from waiting back to ready so it gets scheduled. So, you know, during the entire time that previously we were busy waiting, now the thread is just sleeping and doing nothing. So the lock could be held, and there could be 10 threads waiting on the lock, but none of those threads are going to be busy waiting. The only time you're busy waiting is during the very brief periods where something is actually calling acquire or release. And at all other times, there's no busy waiting going on. People see how that's working? That makes sense to everyone? Right, so essentially using this kind of solution, we've accomplished all of the goals we wanted, 
we are not requiring interrupts to be disabled, right? Because that's you know very limiting and potentially dangerous, and also requires you know context switching into kernel mode. Um, and we are, we can't entirely eliminate busy waiting, but we're essentially capping busy waiting at a very small interval, regardless of how the actual the critical section that the lock is guarding. That critical section can be as long as we want. Busy waiting is still still going to be very minimal. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to get through today. So uh, just to review what we've talked about. Um, so you know, communication among threads, typically you're doing that by accessing a shared variable. And so synchronization is essentially how threads can cooperate to safely access that shared information. So you know, we talked about critical sections or you know, pieces of code that you cannot be executing in parallel over multiple threads. And typically that's going to include you know, the access of shared variables. Um, and then we talked about, remember, two implementations for doing lock primitives. And the first one is where we're going to just disable interrupts, which ensures that the CPU can never, you know, take control away from the current process until it's finished, you know, uh, acquiring the lock or releasing the lock. And then we looked at, you know, test and set, which is where we have this hardware support for these atomic operations. And using that, we can perform the critical step of checking whether the lock is active and taking the lock if it is. Um, and then we saw, you know, a, a, another example of how we can add that guard variable to, to minimize the amount of busy waiting. Um, so that's, and, and again, you know, both types we're requiring some kind of architectural support in, actually, in, in order to actually do this. Um, so that's pretty much it for today. And next class, um, we're, we'll cover uh, semaphores and monitors, which are essentially more powerful synchronization objects than locks. <laughs>